And let's, let's just read this John passage together. This is John 13, 34 to 35. And um, read it with me, if you will. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Okay. So there we see the, the purpose of the one another, which is people will know that we are his followers by the way that we treat each other first. And so the first one we had was love one another. And last week we had accept one another. This week we have serve one another. And for that, I chose just one verse um, to kind of be the signature passage here on serving one another from Galatians 5, 13. And here Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I love that phrase, through love. It's all under love. Now, these one another's teach us how to be the church and, and the family, the body, uh, the temple, as we say. And they, they also show us how to identify the church. So when you see people doing this, that they are identified as, as the true church of God. So, I, you know, I think today amongst all of the negative stuff that goes on about the church and our culture and what we see in the media, and uh, I think people are looking for the church. I think people are looking for a representation of Jesus Christ. We, we want to see people that are representing him and, and loving each other and, and living together in community. And... Um, and for the proof, according to Jesus, that he has a church, that he has a fellowship of believers, it's, it's not the influence of the church, it's not the number of people in the church, it's not the popularity, but it's just one thing, it's, it's how do we treat each other. And, and that's how you are to know. And we are a community, um, you know, that's an example of how people are to live. Now, for the most part, we don't talk about this much. We don't really talk about uh, the church being an example of how Christians in a church are the way that they, they get along, being an example to, to the world. But for the early church, I mean, this is, I started off on that in the first sermon. This was everything. This was the magnet. This is what drew people in, was the way that the, the early Christians treated each other. And, and the apostles, they'd put up with a lot of junk in church. They, they, people do a lot of things wrong, but they would not tolerate someone who was uh, divisive, somebody who tried to break the church up and have factions. And the community was so important that it was protected from any person that would start, you know, this group against that group or, or whatever. And they, you know, Paul would put them out. And I know it sounds just really harsh to put somebody out of church, but it was even more so back then um, because there was only one church. So, you know, you get put out here, you just go down the road. Then you got put out, you were just without. You were outside the Christian community. So they wouldn't tolerate this one thing, and they, they wanted the community to be strong. They wanted the community to really be an example to the world, kind of a foretaste of what heaven's going to be like. People are going to get along with each other. And they're going to put each other first. They're going to love each other. And that was just a strong magnet. So... Uh, people were first attracted to how the Christians treated each other. And today, we, we have so much scripture on this, serve one another. And I want to just go through a couple of passages. And the first one is going to be from Mark 10, 35 to 45. And you've, you've seen this before, I'm sure. It's, it's a little long, and then we're going to go to John 13. But first, this Mark 10, 35 to 45 passage. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, that's Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, uh, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism in which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with 
which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know what those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them? But it shall not be among you, for whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, you know, he did not come to serve, he came to serve. This is Jesus, the Son of God. I did not come to serve, but I came, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. And, you know, we look at this and you think, well, that's kind of strange. He goes into this little discourse on serving. So, you know, what, what happened to set this whole thing up? And just a few verses before this, in Mark 10, 32 to 34, we have the scene that sets all this up. And the disciples and Jesus are walking in Jerusalem, and he's explaining to them, right before this passage I read, he's explaining to them what's going to happen. And he says, you know, guys, I've got some news for you. Um, the religious leaders are going to arrest me. And they're going to falsely accuse me and they're going to spit on me and they're going to beat me and they're going to kill me. And then I'm going to rise from the dead. And he tells them that. And I mean, that's, that's got to be some shocking news because they think he is, you know, he's great popularity. He just tells him he's going to be put to death. And then in verse 35, like what we read, uh, James and, and, and John, the sons of Zebedee, asked Jesus to let them have whatever they ask for and just kind of like a little kid says, Mommy, um, you know, I want you to say yes, but I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you a question, Mommy. We want you to say yes. And and uh, he says, what do you want me to do for you? And and they said, well, let one of us sit on your right and one of us on your left in your glory. And, well, you talk about being presumptuous. You, you talk about uh, they, they felt that they deserved these seats of honor. It's, it's kind of like... Um, you know, they were saying, we called it, you know, when the other guys said, uh, oh, who gets sit by him? They go, well, we called it. We called a long time ago. You know, that's because we really deserve it. And wow, I'm glad that none of us are like that. <laughs> you know, we, we never asked to be first at anything. We never, you know, want the corner office or, you know, we want the better computer at the office or we, we never ask to be first. We never want our choice for dinner. Well, actually, we're just like these guys. I mean, let's let's get real. We really are. Some part of us, we, we may not be like that every day, every minute, but we all want what we want, don't we? I mean, we're human beings. And Jesus looks back at them and he says, you know, you guys, you don't know what you're asking for. Do you, do you drink the cup that I can drink? And that's it's kind of a weird thing. We wouldn't use that expression, you know. But what, every place in the New Testament where the word cup is mentioned, it means either death or life. And nevertheless, James and John, they go, oh, oh yeah, we can do that. That's no problem. Yeah, we, 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 we can drink your cup. We can die with you, you know. And, and Jesus says, it's not really my decision to make. Now, remember that this conversation is not just between these two brothers. There are 10 eavesdropping followers nearby. And for that reason, Jesus launches into this speech about service because he wants to make it crystal clear that his disciples are to put others first, but they didn't get it. They just don't get the message. And I wish we could say that they understood and began to serve one another, but but doesn't turn out that way that's not what they do and in fact just a short time later we have a scene that shows just how difficult it is to become a servant in heart but this other passage before we go there i would just want to point out how counterculture this is to be a servant i mean it's extremely difficult i mean, every, every message that we receive tells us that we deserve it. Every message that we receive says, you ask first. You get in the front of the line. And the world says, you know, sing your own praise. 
Post your own stuff. Make sure everybody knows everything that's happened to you and how good you are. Because if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it. And you know, you deserve it. That's what the world tells us. Brag at every opportunity you get. Make people think that you're better than them. Never show weakness. Instead, say, me first. Choose me. I get more. I've been cheated. I deserve this. The world says this, and then our flesh, our human nature. You know, no one has to teach a child how to do this. Those of you with children know how it is. No one has to teach a child things like, how come she gets to do that and I don't? Right? It just comes naturally to us as human beings. We just think that, you know, we should get ours first and that, you know, I don't care what she gets. I want mine. And for us just to say, let, let me help you go first. You know, why don't you take mine? Because I don't really want the bowl of ice cream. Why don't you go ahead and take mine? It's just very unnatural to us. It seems very strange to us. And, you know, you know, it, strangeness, weird, and it's impossible to do just because we know that we should. We, we may know that we should do that, but gosh, nobody's going to do that 24-7. So it's understandable that after three years of living with Jesus and hearing this and watching Jesus pour out his life into these guys, that they didn't get it, the disciples. He was the servant Lord, and yet they were asking, what can I get out of this? And it's really difficult to develop a servant's heart today, but it was even much more difficult in this Roman culture. Because, you see, we, we don't talk much about the Roman culture, but did you know that in the Roman culture itself that mercy was considered to be immoral? We consider to give somebody mercy or compassion to be a virtue, but not in the Roman culture. Mercy and to have pity on someone was, was immoral was what it was. They had disdain for people who, would, who were poor. People who had without, didn't receive love and compassion, at least like we do in our, we think we should in our, our culture. In the Roman culture, that was a terrible thing to do. So Jesus is coming and he is saying something, just flipping the world upside down, you know. And to, to seek to become a servant at heart was was ridiculous to them. And yet in that culture came a man who was the son of God and had left glory and had come to serve and not be served and to create other people who wanted to be servants too and teach them how to do that. Now the other passage I want to just touch on just briefly is, you know the scene, it's John 13. It, uh, that passage that we read earlier as we started off was from John 13. It takes place in, in the upper room. Uh, the first verse says that it was just right before the Passover feast and Christ was to talk to them about love and show his disciples love. And at, by this time, Judas Iscariot is still there. Everybody's together and they've already sat down for the meal and it's become quite obvious that someone was conspicuously absent. The servant boy who typically sat at the door and washed the feet of the guests as they came in was not there that night. And so no one had washed their feet. And this was just standard protocol because they were dirty and they would have a, a table that was just a, you know, six to 12 inches off the floor and they would recline on their sides and they had these dirty, stinking feet that they had been walking in all day. It was just being a good host. But the boy wasn't there that night. And so while this is going on, the meal is being served, the disciples are discussing which one of them's the greatest. That's, that's a good thing to do. Jesus has just told you about being a servant. And here you're at dinner with him, and he's poured his life into you for three years. And what are you going to discuss at this meal? Which one of us is the best? See, they, we, we just don't get this. And Simon Peter, you know, he's, maybe he says, well, you know, I was the one that came up with that whole thing of Jesus being Messiah. It was me. And I did walk on water. <laughs> right? 
pretty good stuff. His Andrew, his brother, he goes, well, yeah, but you, you remember I introduced you to him. So if I wouldn't have introduced you to Jesus, you'd still be cleaning fish, brother. Maybe he goes for the humble guy. James and John, they probably go, well, we're a team. We're, you know, sons of thunder. <laughs> sons of thunder. You know, we, we've got a dynasty already started. We've got a family thing going, James and John. Two of us. I think we're the greatest. And on down the line, they probably went, you know, pointing out, well, I did this and I didn't do that. And How do you think the disciples felt as they caught of their, their vision that Jesus was up from the table and he's taken off his outer coat and he's got a basin and a towel and he's beginning to wash feet. Wow. Talk about a dagger. You know, I wonder how they felt at that moment. I mean, they had just days before marched in the Messiah parade and received him as king of the Jews in, in Jerusalem and but there he was, and he's putting his servanthood to action. And since he had given the speech before and had fallen on deaf ears, now it comes down so that he's going to show them what it looks like to be a servant. And he's, when he's done washing their feet, he says this. He says, do to one another as I have done to you. Serving imitates Jesus. Well, let's never forget that. That when we serve... We are representing him. We are imitating him. You want people to see him in your life? Serve somebody. Eventually, they'll see Jesus there. If you serve long enough, eventually they'll go, there's a family resemblance. You're reminding me of somebody. I can't, oh yeah, it's Jesus. That's who you're reminding me of. So guard your example. People watch everything that we do. They're, they're watching us how we live. In time, they will see, if you serve, they will see that you have fallen in love with this person named Jesus and you are representing him and he is changing your life. And they will learn that you are a servant because you have a master and they will see the master in you. You must always watch your example. Every time you serve, every time you do some modern day equivalent of washing somebody else's feet, of humbling yourself to help someone else, you are imitating Jesus. Based on his research, a guy named Adam Grant of Wharton School of Business identified three basic kinds of workers. Those of you that are in the workplace now could probably identify with this. He says there are takers, there's matchers, and there's givers. Takers see the workplace as a competitive dog-eat-dog -dog kind of place. And if I don't look out for myself, nobody else is going to do it for me. He says, matchers believe that its work relationships are governed by an even exchange of favors. You do for me and I do for you. And that's how the workplace is. And then there are the givers. And they are other people focused, paying more attention to what other people need from them. And their hallmark is generosity at work. They give to other people, not expecting to get anything back. Grant did a study on this and he found that only 8% of people describe themselves as givers at work. And that's because most people assume that in the workplace, givers will never get ahead in their career. But also when people are stressed out at work, their first instinct is to retreat into the taker mentality. When things get rough, I look out for myself. But Grant's research consistently shows that givers are among the most successful people in the workplace. And they also, he says, are the happiest. In one study, Grant found that givers who were high school teachers, so high school teachers that identified themselves as givers, were less vulnerable to stress and exhaustion if they saw the impact that their giving was having on their students. So they had purpose, okay? Now, being a giver at work also has lasting benefits on well-being outside of work, in a study of 68 firefighters, those who helped others on the job, who were the givers, felt happier at home at bedtime than those who did not. So Grant asked the question that's relevant to every follower of Christ. Would you rather achieve success at work that comes at the expense of others or in ways that lift people up? 
If you could have success, would you rather achieve it by being a giver or being a matcher? Okay? Most people haven't heard of uh, this pro running back. I hadn't until I saw his story. It comes from Sports Illustrated a couple years ago. His name's Tony Richardson. His primary role involves helping other running backs succeed. He's a blocker. You don't notice these guys, but all running backs have blockers that run close to them, and all they do is block other people for them. And over his 17-year span in pro football, teams have often paired Richardson with some of the best uh, backs in pro football. In 2001, he was slated to be the main running back, but instead he went to his teammate, Priest Holmes, and told him, he says, it's time for me to step out of the way. You need to be getting the ball, and I'm going to do everything I can to help you. So Holmes went on to lead the league in rushing that year, but Richardson never grew envious or resentful. As Holmes would report, he used to call me up every day and say, I just saw you on Sports Center." He was happier for me than I was for myself. All of the running backs that Richardson helped succeed contend that his influence went way beyond blocking for them. He would constantly talk to them through the game. He would be advising, encouraging, pushing, inspiring them. And in a recent interview, Tony Richardson said, I love this. He said, I can't explain it, but it just means more to me to help someone else achieve glory. There's something about it that feels right to me. Isn't that a neat statement? Why does it feel right? What does it feel right to us when we help someone else and we see them succeed? Because that's how God made us in his image. He, he made us to be servants the same way that Christ is a servant. And that's how he made the world to work before it got all tainted with this selfish stuff that we suffer under right now. When we help someone else, it, it makes us a part of God's great plan and it feels right to us. Wouldn't it be great if your child, if your son or daughter became a better person than what you are? Did more than what you did? Wouldn't it be great if your brother or your sister or your neighbor or your friend achieved more than what you've achieved? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Wouldn't it be great if the person sitting next to you today achieved more in life than you did? And you could help that. Stop and think about that. That's the way God made the world to be, for us to help each other. Jesus was a servant. He served God the Father. He taught his followers to be servants. And when we grow into be servants, we live in such a way that shows God. Jesus came and established his kingdom here on earth. It's a kingdom based on servants like us and serving him and serving one another. The church is like a foretaste of what the world will be like someday when everybody, when he returns and makes everything right and everybody looks out for each other's best interest. That's what heaven's going to be. That's what this world's going to be. And the church is to be a foretaste of that. We're supposed to be just this little example of what it's going to be like someday. And other people go, man, that's right. That's the way it should be. Can, can I be with you guys? You know, I, there's a place in town, and this is kind of a flawed example, but it, it works for me, so just, just bear with me, okay? There's a place in town that's kind of a foretaste of that for me. You guys like Chick-fil-A? Oh, man, I love Chick-fil-A, not just the food. I love to go to Chick-fil-A because what does the Chick-fil-A person do? What, what do they say? When you drive up to Chick-fil-A, what do they say to you on, on the microphone? How may I serve you? That's what they say. And, and I, I, th this is an unofficial Don study, but, but I am absolutely certain that the people that are inside Chick-fil-A are happier than the other fast food restaurants. Did you ever notice that? Unless you happen to sit next to the playground. If you happen to sit next to the playground, it's kind of a bummer for old people. But if you're in the rest of the restaurant, everybody else is just happy. It's because that servant attitude, it just saturates that place. How can I serve you? How can I help you today? 
Wouldn't it be neat to live in that world? Wouldn't it be neat to live in a world where that was the, not just the, the standard procedure, not, not the company policy, but that was the heart of every person. And wouldn't it be neat to have a huge church where that was just Chick-fil-A, okay? Not the food, but how can I serve you? Yeah. Take that home with you. Let's, let's break for a minute. As deep cries out 